Well, good morning again. I want to say a quick word of thanks to Don for your thoughts for the Lord's Supper. But more than that, uh, when I called Don this past week to see if he would be willing to lead the thoughts in the Lord's Supper, because in my mind, if you don't know the thoughts of Don Ward and you know that how he is able to articulate so many things, um, like you need to get to know him better because he is so good at that. And I was thinking, man, Easter Sunday, great time to have Don Ward speaking at the Lord's Supper. And he said, yeah, I'd be willing to if I make it out of the hospital just fine. And I'm like, wait, what? And so when he's talking about amening to coming out, of, like that Jesus rose from the grave, I'm sitting here thinking, amen, that Don Ward was able to rise from the hospital bed and, and be able to give that. So I, I say that for one, a thanks to him, but also then a challenge for the rest of you guys. If I call you and ask you to do the Lord's Supper and you give me any excuse that is anything less than I'm at the, on, in the hospital on a hospital bed, I'm just going to send you to Don to talk to him for a little bit, all right? <laughs> Thank you so much for those words, Don. It meant so much to me uh, this morning because it is a glorious day. What a wonderful day we have. It's not simply because it's spring. It's not simply because the flowers are blooming, the birds are chirping, and for those of us who have been entrenched with all of the LTC stuff, that LTC is done. It is a glorious day in so many ways. It's a good day, but it is a glorious day because it's Easter. And this is a wonderful time. And as Don said earlier, it's not something new to us. We celebrate this, and we celebrate what happened, not just every Sunday, but honestly, there are those of us that celebrate that he has risen every morning. Whenever we're able to join in in the resurrection uh, every day of our life, and that, that his, his word and his air fills our lungs, we praise him that he is risen every day. But sometimes we forget the importance of this day. We forget what is going on. A Sunday school teacher was asking her, her class on the Sunday before Easter, trying to prepare them, these little kids, for this understanding of Easter. So she asked, hey, does anyone know what Easter means? Why is Easter so important? One little girl spoke up and said, well, Easter, isn't that the time whenever we gather with the family, we eat turkey and we talk about like pilgrims and things like that? Said, no, that's not it. Then one of the boys uh, said, well, I know what Easter is. Easter is whenever we get a tree and we decorate this tree with fancy colors and, and all these things. We, we exchange gifts and, uh, and the teacher cut him off. No, that's not Easter either. And finally, one boy said, I know what Easter is. Easter is when Jesus was killed. He was put in a tomb for three days. And the teacher was sighing a, 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 just some relief of saying, finally someone. But the boy continued. He says, everyone gathers outside his tomb and we wait to see whenever Jesus comes out. And if he sees a shadow, we have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> so close. You know, some people have some strange ideas about Easter, and not just kids. There are some people that think Easter is about a bunny and some eggs to go and find. I've already been accused of uh, dressing like an Easter egg this morning. Um, well, you can find me. That's, there's the benefit right there. Some people view it just as a secular kind of holiday, for that purpose. Some people view Easter as a, as a chance to, uh, to dress up and go to church for a change because they're not normally doing it. And so Easter's a good time. Well, yeah, let's go, to, let's go to church because Easter, it's a good time. In fact, in church lingo, uh, we have a term for some, those people that'll show up uh, Christmas and Easter, um, and those are the only two times you see them. We call them creasters which I find funny in church lingo that that is actually a thing, but it's what is talked about. For others, it's the opposite side of the spectrum. Easter's just another day. I grew up in a similar uh, kind of faith tradition as many people here, and whenever I grew up, uh, that Easter was not something we, we would mention, but it wasn't a big deal because it was always mentioned, we celebrate this every week. 
The rest of the religions are focusing one week a year. We're doing it right for the 52. It wasn't said like that, but it felt like that as a kid. It felt like we are more holy because we downplay Easter on Easter. We upplay it on the other 51 weeks. And so for some, Easter is just another Sunday. I don't know where you land. And it really doesn't matter where you land, because we're all here together. And some people might just be coming because they've been forced, and they would rather be out hunting some Easter eggs right now. Some people are excited about their new clothes that they're wearing because this is a part of the tradition that they grew up in, and this is the time to show off those new clothes and come to church, and we are glad you're here. And some of you were going to be here this Sunday regardless of what it, what it was called on the calendar And you might care less about the title of the day, and we are still glad that you're here. Because the thing is, no matter where you come from, Jesus came for all of us. No matter who we are or what is happening, and that's what makes this day such a glorious day. I believe to the Christian, Easter is the most glorious day. Because we understand something that the world needs to see as well. In John 20, we read about this first Easter. And it, there's a lot of different accounts, but I'm just taking it from John 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So this is after the Good Friday, all the things that happened of the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he is placed in the tomb And then Holy Saturday happens whenever everyone is just waiting. When hope seems to be lost because their Lord and Savior is buried in a tomb. And all their dreams are buried with him. But we know what they didn't know at the time. They didn't understand that Sunday was a coming. And that Sunday was a coming so early Sunday morning... When Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran, and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, who most scholars think is John, the one who Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They both were running. I love this little scene, because these are boys being boys. There's a race going on. And the reason I know there's a race going on is because the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love the authenticity of the writer of this gospel, of saying, you know, Peter, I'm sure whenever he got to the tomb, he's like, no one's going to know that you beat me to the tomb. And John's like, you want to (laughs) bet? Everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to know. I love it. But John also then is humble in this. He says he stooped, into, uh, stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. I don't know why John didn't go in, but he didn't. Then Simon Peter, he arrived. He went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. But I want you to notice, very next verse, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Perhaps we shouldn't be so hard on some people that don't understand why this day is so important to a Christian. Because even what we would consider the first Christians, the first followers of Jesus, they didn't get it. They didn't get it even whenever, like we can continue on in the story, they didn't get it even whenever uh, they heard the evidence of Jesus being raised from the dead. Some of them saw him and still were questioning. They still missed it. And so maybe we shouldn't be so hard on some people that show up on Easter And don't appreciate it for all it is. Because even the disciples struggled with that. Easter celebrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But actually it celebrates so much more. 
See, a lot of times whenever we come to Easter, we spend so much time focusing on Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then Easter, and what happens with the death, burial, and resurrection, and that is wonderful. That is good to focus on, but Easter actually celebrates more than just that moment, that short little three days. Easter celebrates the fullness of life of Jesus. And Easter even celebrates that he rose from the dead once and he is coming back again so that we all can raise from the dead as well. So there's this hope ingrained within Easter that keeps us looking back and looking forward to what Jesus has done and what he is going to do and everything in between. Easter's about the life of Christ. There's a man by the name of Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman that I believe understood this pretty well. He wrote a poem. I don't know exactly when he wrote it, but in 1908, he was speaking at a, uh, a Bible lecture, and uh, he handed this poem to the organist. It wasn't Church of Christ lecture, by the way. So he handed it to the organist, a guy by the name of Charles Marsh, this poem, and he said, make this into music. And he did. And for over a hundred years, Christians have been singing a song about one day, one glorious day. So this morning, I'm going to intersperse the song into the sermon. We're going to sing a verse, then I'm going to talk about it. We're going to sing another verse, and we're going to talk about it. So the song is One Day. You might be familiar with it, written at least at 1908. Sing with me. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, all glory tell you, there's a lot in this song to unpack. But I'm going to start in John 1, 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, so the Word became human, became flesh, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. I like to just imagine that scene. That heaven is filled with the praises of Jesus. The praises of God. And one day, whenever heaven is glorifying God and is, it all is being exalted by all these legions of angels, the scene shifts to what's happening on earth. And the song describes the earth of being full of the blackness of sin. The darkness of sin. Man had the written word of God They had the prophets to tell them what they needed to do. They had everything they needed to live holy and sanctified lives. And yet, over and over, they still didn't get it. They didn't understand what it meant to follow God. And as much as I'd like to say they, I I have to say we. We have the Word of God. We have examples among us. We have people calling us into righteousness and righteous living, and we sometimes still don't understand what it means to live for God. Someone once said, when God sent his word through Moses, the, t- the people did not do a very good job following it. So God, in his infinite wisdom, sent his son, Jesus, as the word to come alive 
This way they could see the word in action. I like that. Because when sin filled the world, the song tells us Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. See, the gift of Jesus is not just justification from sin. Jesus came to sanctify us so that we can truly live. Now, I just dropped two pretty big church words on you if you weren't following this morning, talking about salvation, justification, and sanctification. So let me put this another way. Jesus didn't come simply just to forgive our sins by dying on the cross. That is a wonderful thing that he did to justify us from sin. But Jesus did more than just justify us from sin. He taught us and showed us how to truly live. That is part of the gift of Jesus as well. That is sanctification. He taught us to not just forget. He didn't just come to forgive our sins. He taught us not to be dominated by sin while we're still living. Forgiveness and freedom. And that freedom comes through a life of the example of Jesus. Following his example. In fact, Jesus himself would say this in John 10.10, that I have come to give life, life in all its fullness. The life of a Christian is a full one. That doesn't mean that everything goes our way, that everything works out the way that we want. It doesn't mean that we never get fired. It doesn't mean that we never experience sicknesses. It doesn't mean that we never die. No, those things happen to a Christian. But when your life is full, those things have lost their sting. Those things lose their power because you have power in Christ. Jesus came to show us what a rich and full life looks like. But even more than that, he also came, not just to die for our sins, he came to show us what our our death should look like. Because he gave the example of not just his death, but how Christians should go to their death in a service for others, in full love for others. Or as the song continues saying, living, he loved me, Dying, he saved me. The life of Christ is a sacrificial life. And the life of a Christ follower is also a sacrificial life. That's what makes Easter so special is Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And now we have that opportunity as well. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering, anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he cared. My sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus paid the price for our sin once and for all. For all of our sin. For the fullness of our sin. There is no extra sacrifice that is needed for your sins to be forgiven. He paid it all. The price for sin is death. And it was an eternal death for us. No one here would want to pay that price. When we understand what it means and what it looks like and truly what it is, I believe people would really gather the ideas of we don't want that in our future. You don't want that kind of debt in our future. And Jesus paid that price for us. 
the sinless Lamb of God, gave his life. And that's the only way it worked, because he was sinless. And he was able to take away our sin, to bear our sin upon him. Some of you may have seen The Passion of the Christ, movie directed by Mel Gibson in 2004. Uh, Junior, you may not have seen this one because it's a Christian movie. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> I thought about showing a picture of the scene that I wanted to, that I want to illustrate, but whenever I looked at the picture uh, and grabbed that on, um, on the internets, I realized I don't want to throw that up on the screen uh, because it is, it is a very gruesome scene. The scene where they're nailing Jesus to the cross. And it's a powerful image. And maybe you can conjure up what, what that image in your mind and give you enough of the indication. But what's really fascinating, and some of you may know this, in this movie, you see the hands holding a nail and a hammer and about to hammer into the hands of Jesus. And some of you may know this, that the hands that you see in, this, in that scene are Mel Gibson's hands. He didn't want anyone else to do it. He, he wanted to bear that guilt. He wanted to have that. But here's an interesting thing that you may not have realized. See, we see his hands, but you never see the face of the person who nailed Jesus to the cross. You never see the person's face. You never got a glimpse of the eyes or the heart of the one who just assuredly pounds away the spikes into Jesus' flesh as it comes to rest in the wood on the cross. You never see his face. The reason for that is Mel Gibson didn't want to show his face. He wanted us to realize the ones that were nailing, the, nailing Jesus to the cross, it, it's our face. He wants, wanted us to put our face there with his hands because that's what happened. Yeah, you may not have, you weren't alive in this time. And you may be thinking, well, how could I be responsible for this? If we were there, we would have been still in the crowds. We would have, if we weren't the ones calling for, to crucify Jesus, literally, it's our sin that cries that out. Because our sin needs redemption. Our sin needs an answer, and Jesus is the answer. And because you have sin in your life, Jesus paid that price. And it is your sin that nailed him to a cross. But Jesus was willing to pay that price. He loved us so much that he went to the cross for our sins. But thank God that's not the end of the story. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he did conquer. Now is ascended my Lord evermore. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. First Corinthians. 15, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into the bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was resurrected, and he promises a resurrection for us all, death has lost its sting. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to not be afraid of dying. It's a natural part of living to be afraid of the end of life. It is very natural. But one of the wonderful things, one of the glorious things that a Christian gets to grasp and take hold of is in their dying days, death does not have the final word. They know that there's a hope that is beyond death, and they are already living a life that is eternal. They have within them, as a Christian, the eternal life of Jesus. And we praise God even through death. Because, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? One day we are going to live with no more pain, no more sin, no more problems. One day we will be able to live with Jesus evermore. Let's sing this final verse together. One day the trumpet will sound with his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Jesus will return. I love that at the end of movies, especially Marvel movies, they started getting really good with this of saying, you know, whenever you have a little question at the end of the movie, then it'll say, you know, Thor will return in whatever. And you're like, oh, good. You know, he's going to come back. They got that from the Bible. They didn't get much from the Bible, but they at least got that from the Bible. And I love that. Jesus will return. The story of Easter is not just the celebration that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's the celebration that Jesus is coming back to raise us all. Whether we are dead or not at the time of his re uh, return, we are going to be raised with him. We are going to be able to be with him forever. And what a glorious day that's going to be. Unless you're not in Christ. And I feel like that at least needs mentioned. Because sometimes we get all the hoorah of Easter of like, this will be a glorious day, a wonderful day. And we forget that those of us who are in Christ, we can sing that song and we can sing it with full heart. But those who are not in Christ, there are people out there. There are people you know. They might be your family members. They may be your friends. They may be people you work with. They may just be people that you don't even like. But I'm going to tell you right now that you have to, have to dislike someone really bad to wish them to go to hell. To not share the good news with them. Because there will be people that on that day do not get to come with Jesus. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. I find it really interesting that there are going to be people that claim that they are Christian on the day of Jesus' return and Jesus is going to be like, yeah, I don't know you. We bear your name. Yeah, it's one thing to bear the name of Jesus. It's quite another to bear his image, to bear his likeness, to follow in his footsteps, to be as he was. And on that day, I can't think of a, a greater slap in his face than to say, we did all these things for you, but we never really knew you. 
And I wonder if Jesus would look at him and say, that, I came and died for you. And the best you could do for me was go through the motions? I gave my life for you, and the best that you can do is honor me with your lip service? I died for you. How many people did you tell about me? How many people did you share the good news with? Because on that day, there's going to be people that think they are good with Jesus. But on that day, they're going to be stuck in Good Friday. And they're not going to experience Easter. To me, that's reality check. Because I don't think anyone... I don't think anyone should go to hell. I don't think anyone should miss that day. Because I think that's a glorious day that's coming. That Easter reminds me that this day is going to be amazing. And even if I don't know the people there, it's just something about everyone gathering together and praising Jesus that just gets me excited. And I want everyone there. And I hope you do too. And so we have a mission. Those of us who are in Christ, we can already sing about this glorious day. But we have a mission to share the good news with others so that when that day comes, they can also sing about the glorious day. That's what Jesus wanted. Scripture even tells us that God does not want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to be saved. And he wants to use us in sharing that good news. So this morning, as I started, I'm going to end. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if this is just a normal routine for you. If you're just going through the motions, I don't know if this is a a once and twice a year kind of event for you to come to church. I don't know if you have some of the wrong ideas about what Jesus is and what the church is, but I want you to know that Jesus came to save you Wherever you're at, wherever your journey has taken you, whatever sin you've accumulated across the journey, he's come to save you. Will you accept his call? Will you be buried with him through the waters of baptism so that you can rise to new life as he did on Easter morning? Will you follow in his footsteps to the best of your ability every day so that when the day comes of his return, Not only will he be welcoming you with open arms, you will be expectantly waiting for that day to come because it will be a glorious day. And if you're in need of understanding, of study, or if you're in need of baptism or whatever your need might be, elders and ministers will surround this auditorium. Feel free to find any one of us. But if you'd rather just find a person across the aisle from you, down the pew from you, this song that we're about to sing is a great opportunity for you to just bear your heart with someone, come clean before the community, before your God and Savior, or whatever you might need. Now's the time. Would you let it be known as we stand and sing together?